and we will start today's lecture. This is the last lecture of the course. It's going to be an introduction to Visual Slab. Okay, so again, this is um, <clears throat> it's a very broad topic. There's many, many publications, and we will just present some of the techniques that are very representative. I couldn't include all of them. All of them, they are doing some contribution, but I think this is a good starting point if you want to go deeper later, I don't know, maybe other projects you have, other courses, works, whatever. Okay, so let's start with um, something that should look very familiar to all of us, right? Uh, this publication by Davidson, Monoslam, it was one of the first successful applications of SLAM, right? Just by using pure vision. Um, <clears throat> uh, I will show later like uh, some images, but uh, this evaluation was done on a kind of handheld camera. And at that time, it was not so easy to do like uh, obtain good results here, right? So that's what I'm just, you know, starting with this. What is the idea? Um, the technique, uh, just describing the back end, it's, it's uh, online slam. Right, so we are going to be um, estimating current state and it's using EKF, right? So this was the introduction to SLAM that we did in some lectures, but of course here with cameras, there were like some peculiarities that made the problem a little more challenging, right? Um, so how is this done? Right, because uh, we know that, okay, we want to estimate what is the current state, uh, what are the landmarks or points in this world, right? That is going to be a map. But how is this done? Well, first thing is that they were detecting sparse but persistent features, right? So what is this? Salient things in the environment that can be detected uh, with, uh, well, uh, simple, uh, key point detectors, right? And I think at this point they were just using image patches. They were not using any of the modern um, key point detectors that we have right now. But uh, still, um, well, let's say that the image gets, um, I mean, from an image, what we want to obtain is this small set of uh, salient points that are going to be describing uh, the full map, right? And on the image, you will see this a little more clear. What is the second point? General motion model for a smooth camera movement, right? So they don't have odometry, right? They don't have a robot that moves, I don't know, counting wheel ticks or any other. So what they had to do is just uh, take smoothness assumptions on the movement of the camera. And this helped uh, basically with transition function. So we know we know about the, uh, well, I'm, I'm here for putting this roughly speaking, just to have relations with the uh, course, I mean, course material, right? But it's not that inside, it's a little different. Uh, but still the idea is that here, we are adding information about the motion, right? Just by assuming that, look, take a look, there's no action here, so we are not, we don't know, we just have a camera handheld, right? But somehow there should be smoothness, right? So it means that here inside there's included some velocities. And you know that if you have a velocity, you have a point, you just keep integrating things as you progress, right? So this is how you um, encode smoothness uh, constraints. Second important thing, right? This was real time. so. Uh, even at that time, yes, there were computers, powerful enough, but still some of the techniques might not be uh, real time. But with this uh, effective uh, filtering, they were obtaining this. And we know that um, one of the properties of SLAM, right, if it's not very loopy, it's not observing the same thing over, is that uh, it's drift free, right? So if you were not keeping this map of the environment, eventually um, your trajectory can drift, right? can diverge from the real. While if you have observations of the map, uh, this helps you alleviate a little the problem, right? Of drifting. 
And well, this thing, it's gonna be a constant <clears throat> in today's method. So the problem of um, visual slam is um, initialization. So, okay, what we have here is that we have some features that we observe from an image. Um, we have a smoothness of the camera. Um, okay, I didn't include this, but landmarks are going to be 3D points, right, in the world. So the hardest question is how do we start initializing this if with a single image you cannot really observe depth, right? You cannot really observe these 3D points. So on all methods that I'm going to be talking today, this is going to be a constant. How to initialize uh, your algorithm correctly, right? I hope that uh, you see that in problem set three, initialization is kind of important, right? Uh, but uh, after you have enough observations, this, because we are doing a batch update, this problem just goes away. If you have a single um, observation that you need to initialize your map with, then uh, the filter is sensitive to these initial conditions, right? So, okay, um, let's take a closer idea of what this means. Um, here, this is our state variable. Um, including this is robot pose plus velocities, right? So I'm not here going to define like what are they using, but uh, well, they were using quaternions, angular velocities, translational velocities, and positions. And then each of these landmarks um, is a 3D point, right? So you see the you see the example here. So in this case we see on the image, right? So this is the image we are seeing like uh, detected these patches. I'm not gonna enter in what is the procedure for doing this, right? But uh, this is, uh, now we have uh, better uh, tools for doing this that at that time, but still it was very impressive. So just with simple patches. So you see here, there's like a corner, all these patches correspond to, um, well, um, uh, let's say that salient points in the image. So you see there's nothing here in this kind of um, uniform texture. So that's a reason. And then what we see on the right is this 3D map, okay, with this rendering of where the camera is, right? So this is the, our XT. And this, then uh, all these are going to be the, um, landmarks, right? So these points in 3D are our landmarks. And well, you see the idea is very similar to what we discussed. However, uh, peculiarity here is that we don't have photometry. So when we move, uh, that's what why they were including here these velocities. And the second thing um, we didn't discuss is what is this observation function? Okay, so um, this is going to be another introduction to projective geometry in one minute, but um, this is just for you to grasp the idea. I mean, there's behind like a lot of math and probably this is another course, but let's keep it this way, okay? We'll have an observation function that requires our current uh, position, pose, and this uh, set of landmarks, right? Which is our map. So, so far, this is generalization of the observation function. Now, what is this uh, observation function uh, observing? Well, we'll have like this set of set observations. So in this case, these uh, set observations are um, pixel coordinates, okay? So what is this? Uh, you just come here, go to the image, and um, you know, get the coordinates, coordinates of the patches, right? So this is uh, just in pixels, in pixels. Yeah, I'm going to change the color. Okay, so we know that this is pose, we know that this is 3D points, and then what is happening is that, imagine we have a landmark here, and another landmark here. And we have the image plane 
here, right? And this is the camera. So this is just, just to grasp the idea. I'm not really getting into many of the details. But you might assume that this observation function, what actually it's doing, it's projecting these points in 3D to the image plane, right? To 2D, right? So what it's doing is, uh, okay, try to imagine that these are straight lines originated at the center of the uh, sensor. And then what you will be seeing is that there's, there's an operation, it's a very simple operation, going from projecting things, it's always easy because you just lose, uh, um, you just lose some variables, some degrees of freedom, right? So in this case, we will be like uh, from 3D, right? Projecting to the image plane, right? To, to the, if you want, right? right? And then there's gonna be a pixel coordinates that corresponds to the projection of this 3D landmark, right? So roughly speaking, this is what this uh, projectivity is doing. We also need to transform with respect to the uh, local coordinates. So that's why we have here the, um, well, the pose. Without pose, these landmarks, we know that this will be in local map, uh, in the global frame, right? So if we want a local map of this, uh, first we need to transform, but okay, let's say that this is transformed. And then this operation is just ray tracing things until you intersect with the image plane. Is that clear? I hope that maybe some of you have already worked on problems like this, but if not, I would like, I would like yes, uh, to do like sanity check because most of the things in Visual Slam are gonna be based on this. So can anyone write something? Is this familiar or not much? Minus, plus, okay, minus is, I guess, it was not so familiar, plus if you've seen something similar like this, okay. Okay, okay. But the intuition behind is clear, right? So th this, is, this is what I need to ask before we move on. Because once we have these projected kind of um, projected points into the image, we can compare against the um, um, patches that we have detected. Right, so in this case, I don't know, imagine here we have this detection and the patch is here, okay? So it's a slightly off. And what the observation function is trying to do is uh, just match them perfectly, right? Because you know you are seeing that landmark uh, now in 3D and, and well, the map is going to adapt to this, right? So you are gonna be updating against this and basically, yes, this observation is what this thing is relating. It's very, very similar to the, um, to the landmarks, but uh, let's say that this observation function, it's a little more involved, right? But the idea that we were doing in 2D is exactly the same. We were observing just range and bearing. So in this case, you don't have range, you just have bearing, but you have bearing in 3D, right? And a way, a nice way of uh, projecting this is to the image plane directly and then just comparing uh, things in the image plane. Okay, we have a question. How to add velocities to factor graph? Sure, not the topic of this lecture. Uh, yes, this is a good topic. Um, well, here they are doing filtering, right? So they have a state and they update this. Um, if you want to add velocities, to factor graph, I mean, it's not really a big difference. The only thing you need is a transition function, right? So um, for velocities, imagine that you have your X and your velocity, right? And the thing that you need to define is this augmented uh, transition function that takes um, this from the last state, there's gonna be like some actions and then this is um, inside uh, you should be, you should basically able to define like what is this transition function. If you have velocities, maybe you update them. Maybe position is totally determined by integrating velocities and velocities are observed from these observations, these uh, commands, right? All of them start with the transition function. Once you have a transition function, you can define your variables. And with this, you will have Jacobians. And once you have this, everything is well determined because you will have the transition function. You can evaluate residuals. Remember, 
Uh, here, okay, if you want, uh, how, how can we call this? Okay, well, basically you will be matching this to be as close as possible to, to be a small number, right? So let me put this way. So this is this augmented, um, this augmented um, poses with velocities. You want to make them as close as possible to zero, right? So this is gonna be your residual. And this is what you will be uh, minimizing. So once you have this function, we know that uh, you can transform this into a, a residual that is simply this, right? So this, this is the Jacobian and this is the, um, well, residual that we are writing here as B. Okay, just there be some uncertainty in first order and add velocity to the state vector. It all depends on the transition function. I would say that depends on the transition function, how it is, you cannot assume anything. But with that function, you can say if uncertainty propagates, if not, and so on. Okay, anyway, uh, here, this was used, right? Because we were saying that here we have velocities, right? So velocities are kind of ensuring that poses do not teleport, right? So this was another kind of interesting ingredient taking from Islam because, um, well, let's say structure from motion was just um, taking care of image, um, images and, you know, key points here and just optimizing everything. But if you want this to be working on real time, uh, well, adding more information in this case, smoothness on the trajectory helps. Okay. So yes, very interesting. I think that, uh, well, there have been uh, lots of follow-ups. Uh, this paper has definitely impact. It's not really used now, but um, on some way, the next um, versions of Monoslam were really like uh, um, used. Okay, Let, let's, move, let's move to the second um, technique that I would like to introduce today. Uh, it's called PTAM, right? So this stands for parallel tracking and mapping. And we start discussing some of these things yesterday, if you remember, but I'm gonna formalize them a little better, right? So they were introducing the concept of keyframe. And let me explain what this is, right? Imagine we have a trajectory, something like this. And I don't know, this is x of zero, x of one, x of two, many of these, right? For instance, each of them, it's going to be a camera pose, right? Well, and basically, and so on. And here we have XT. Okay, so what we know about filtering is that we take every pose uh, because here there's information, right? There's gonna be like some, um, key points we are detecting or some patches and we want to include them in the filter, right? So this is the version of mono slam or, uh, or classical EKF slam that we were discussing, right? So one can imagine, and this is the most logical assumption to do, right? That you just move over time and all these poses should be including their observations, right? So, Now, the difference is that instead of um, um, doing, taking into account all observations, what we are gonna be doing is just selecting some of them, right? And we are gonna be calling these keyframes. So why is this important? Uh, well, there's another paper that discusses why this is important and what is the effect. But let's say that this has a deep um, impact on, on what is the structure of what we are doing here, right? So the first thing is that now imagine that with all these keyframes, what we do is um, a graph slab, okay? So what it means is that you don't filter, you calculate the trajectory, the poses, corresponding to each of these keyframes, right? So 
Uh, why is that? Because basically uh, you can divide the problem into uh, this small, uh, this smaller version of this, and still each of these images are going to be representative, right, of the problem. And when you do the optimization, there's going to be advantages. Okay, so keyframe is just this. It's selecting uh, some of the images to be processed. And then the question is what happens in between, right? So, well, let's, let's get into this. So, okay, let's say selecting poses and observations for uh, batch optimization. It could be batch, it could be a window uh, optimization of many, I don't know, some, some poses, not the full trajectory, depends, right? But the idea is just to decimate your images. So um, we still need to track the camera pose. So in these increments, we still want to know what is this uh, position. So for doing this, what we do is we break the problem in, in two, right? So the first one is tracking. Right, so tracking is keeping uh, uh, the camera pose localized. So this is gonna be very similar to localization. And the second one is mapping, right? So mapping, I have already advanced some things, but it's basically, uh, well, uh, batch optimization of all keyframes, right? Just trying to um, uh, optimize things at the same time. Imagine like, I don't know, here, uh, you are observing this landmark and this landmark is also observed from here and also from here, right? So this is gonna be a little superior than just doing filtering, right? Because we have all the information together and we know that with batch updates, we are less, uh, more robust to, you know, maybe, um, well, outliers included in the filter, other artifact, basically uh, relinearize things constantly. We don't accumulate error in covariances. Yes, th there's many advantages. Okay, so let's explain then the camera tracking. You can think about this as a localization, right? And, and it's, gonna be, it's gonna be the following, right? So we only care about this um, increment, right? So it's not really that we want to um, calculate what is the full uh, pose, what is, what is the full um, position for this intermediate keyframe or intermediate frame. But uh, we just want not to get lost, right? Not to get lost because maybe later when we add a new uh, keyframe, we want a good initialization, right? If not, things are gonna <laughs> maybe not converge into a solution, right? So how is this done, right? So it's basically a problem of localization, but now in 3D. So the principle is very similar of what I explained before. Uh, we have a map, we project it into an image, and then we are just aligning um, uh, key points that we see in the current image with respect to the ones that are projected from the 3D map, right? So this problem is very, very recurrent when we have sparse features, when you have points, right? That you have them in a 3D structure. Uh, it's kind of the basic um, and most fundamental function, right? That allows this to be working. There's an equivalent version of this that instead of tracking like for particular points in the image looks for all the intensity in the image, right? But um, we will discuss this a little later. Anyway, for this at that time, yes, uh, key point base was like really, uh, well, what made all these problems uh, become real time and robust. So we basically have like, yes, three points, project them into the image, align them. And then with this, what we have is an estimation of how much we have moved, right? You do this for some time. <clears throat> and then um, the question is at some point, you are gonna be observing totally different, not totally different, but let's say different enough image such that you want to add a new keyframe, right? And that's what they were saying. Okay, so after some time or after some, I don't know, amount of overlapping, there are several heuristics, doesn't really matter here because the important thing is that you divide the problem, right? So now it's mapping and it's also tracking, right? So the two things uh, coexist together. 
I already discussed a little about mapping. So this is just graph optimization. You have here like, I don't know, your I don't know, factor graph or whatever you want uh, to use to optimize all um, um, poses of the keyframes, not the intermediate ones, right? These ones just uh, have been lost, right? We are just using them for keeping track and then initializing uh, them. But we optimize all these um, poses and all the observations into points, right, in the map. So this will be like batch optimization, very similar to problem set three, but with 3D. Okay, so this is a little similar of what I described yesterday. So when I was talking about LOM, they were also doing like a strategy of dividing the problem into mapping and, and odometry. In this case, they not just do mapping, but let's say that they do full slam. But the intermediate steps are not necessary because if you try to do this for every, then you don't have enough time to do calculations, right? Imagine this runs at 20 hertz or 30 hertz. You cannot solve a patch solution in, in, in 30 hertz. Even incremental solutions might have uh, trouble, right? So this is the beauty of this. And I think this method was really, it's still like, um, well, very influential in many works, right? That uh, we'll see later. So if I can just summarize it's yes. So we have keyframes and then, well, there's other things about initialization and all this. You can take a look at the video because it's very fun. Uh, they use this, uh, they do kind of the evaluation on uh, augmented reality environments. So once you have a map of the environment, uh, what they were doing is just putting objects there, right? Um, and it's true, right? So you have kind of this structure of the 3D world, you have an object and then you can render it because you know uh, what is the physical, how, how is, I mean, how is the physical environment, right? So it's that uh, you know that uh, table is a table and then you can plot something on top of this. And I don't know, they have other things, very funny ones. Take a look, yes, please take a look at the video. Um, yes, I could be talking about augmented reality and all these things we are seeing on the mobile phone. Uh, well, they are closed, so we don't really know what's going on, but maybe it's a version of this, maybe some filtering. Uh, definitely, uh, they are, you might be using um, uh, key points, but uh, the problem is the same, right? It's um, map, mapping, right, of 3D points in the world and then image and camera pose tracking on a different form, but let's say that, yes. Okay, uh, well, I talk a lot, but um, here we'll have an image, right? So all these red points are correctly matched points in the map, right? So you have an image, you observe some things and here, I don't know, some of them are corners or some of them are other things like every key right on the keyboard. So this is a key point. Okay, yes, why? Because you have a lot of information, right? So there's a gradient, uh, it's well localized. Corners are also very good. I think here they were using fast uh, detector. Uh, and here what we see is that they have more key points, right, than uh, monoslam. So you can afford this if you have this sort of, um, well, two thread uh, process, right? So one of them is taking care of mapping. You can do this with more processing time. And then we have at real time, all this camera tracking that the only thing it's doing is taking the map, projecting, and then associating with whatever, with whatever you see on the image. I think if I remember correctly, the encoding was red, was like correctly associated and blue was, they were looking for a point in the map that didn't get any association. And the others, I guess it's other cases of not correct associations, but yes, basically red is the one that is on the map and it's on the image. Okay, so camera tracking can go very fast. This is just a localization problem. And you know that it's gonna be moving slowly, right? Because frames are very frequent. So you should not be moving like super fast, but still, um, well, 
with this amount of points? Yes, uh, it's possible. Okay, any questions so far? Um, maybe I have one question. Mm -hmm. Um, how do they decide keyframes in PTAM? Um, I cannot really answer, but I can tell you that it's not a good decision, right? So I'm going to discuss later, like a better strategy for deciding uh, keyframes and for updating them as you create the map. But I think in this early stage, the decision for keyframe was not, it, it was an heuristic that made it work, right? For these kind of small environments. So it's actually a very complicated process, right? So um, people are doing several things, but in this case in particular, I should reread read the paper and, and, and take a look. You can take a look later if you want and do um, discussions on the canvas if you want. But I'm telling you, there's better ways, right? So this was just kind of the first uh, paper discussing about keyframes and then the follow-up papers, I think refined a little this process because it's true that it's very sensitive, right? So deciding keyframes is going to affect a lot your problem. Too many, too often might make the problem too dense, right? So you have a lot of similar images, you're optimizing them at the end. Yes, you have too much information. Um, low frequency, you might not have enough overlapping and then you might diverge because you don't have information. So yes, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I cannot give you the answer, but definitely I will reread it uh, later. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have another question here on the chat. Camera can see very similar object in very different places using, for example, shift. You mean shift or what is shift? Shift matching. How it deal, shift, yes. How it deal to get it look closer. Um, well, so far I didn't talk about loop closure. I'm gonna be talking later when I talk about, um, well, another work that I think it was including everything, right? All the advancements, all, all the cool things that have been published, they were compiling this into a single version. But uh, in this case, they were not using Sift. So the problem of Sift is that it's very precise, but it's expensive. So it's hard to get real time um, to get a real-time system with SIF detector, right? And SIF descriptor. So, um, no, I think uh, they were using a simpler version, just fast or even corners. I don't remember now, but um, yes, loop closure, let's say that this is, this is not really like main topic of discussion that they have here. So basically they can reobserve enough things, uh, they can add new points, but they were not doing kind of long trajectories. And after this long trajectory, you were doing a loop closure. This was not discussed in depth, right? In this paper, I think the good thing about this is this uh, parallel tracking and mapping, right? So you divide the processes and this was like a fantastic contribution. On loop closure, hold on, uh, we're gonna be discussing a little later. Okay, so this is, this is another kind of tricky thing, right? All these papers, um, all of them very influential. It's very hard to solve all the problems in once, right? So you should target only, or at least uh, on this, all these contributions were targeting a very specific part, right? So at the beginning, it was how to make this an EKF. The second one was how to still um, calculate things on batch uh, updates instead of filtering, right? Which gives us like more advantages, but for doing this, you need to give up on some other things. Um, yeah, so it's usually like contribution of very specific part, but it's true that there's many, many parts. Uh, I'm gonna comment now on this paper because it was very interesting. The title was controversial, but I think it was hitting like at that time, a very important question, right? For the community. And the question was why filtering, right? And, and the paper is, is, I think, 
Yeah, fantastic. They start saying, look, we are going to be comparing like monoslam and Python. Okay. Uh, there's the general description. So if you put the problem properly, you could be saying that this is a Bayesian network where you include all uh, landmarks right here. You include all observations and all poses. You do this a full Bayesian network. And this is the problem, right? And, and maybe some people from uh, computer vision community have been take it, have been tackling the problem this way, right? You just have a large problem, then uh, you solve things. So maybe yes, this is the general description of bundle adjustment. Maybe you uh, optimize for other things like camera parameters, for instance. But basically, you take all the information into account. Forget about real time. This is not real time. This uh, is kind of a equivalent graphical model. We know that factor graphs here are a little more helpful, but okay, let's say that uh, these two things are uh, kind of equivalent. And then the interesting things come here, right? So this is the graph topology of the filtering scheme, right? What we see is that at every pose, we are observing um, different landmarks, right? So that's true. And then what we have is all these connections that happens when we marginalize, right? So when we remove uh, past poses, we know that the covariance uh, becomes denser and denser, right? So we are removing uh, parts of the graph, we are marginalizing, and at the end, uh, the covariance of all these landmarks, although at the beginning might be, they might be independent, because there's this relation between past poses at the end, they create like a lot of connections, right? So that's what these um, when kind of edges between all landmarks are showing, right? So at the end, we will like assume that EKF has a dense um, covariance matrix, right? And each of these cross terms is just this edge, okay? And this is the alternative of uh, keyframe, right? Uh, keyframes. So here we are not including all of them. We know that we just do tracking just to have a good initial position. And then what we are doing is from some selected points, we are observing uh, these uh, landmarks, right? 3D points, key points, call them what you want. But some of them are going to be common. You better have a lot of points in common, right? If not, it's going to be hard to uh, get something uh, meaningful. And there's maybe some of them that are new, right? They have not been observed before, right? So this is the topology of the two problems that we are discussing here. And it's very important, right? So this, I think these graphics summarize really, really well. What is this? So this work, I think it was at that time saying, look, what is better to do, right? And there's always like trade-offs. But in this case, in this case, the answer was really um, surprising, right? So they were doing a fair comparison. You can take a look at this paper if you want. It's in Canvas or just uh, look in Google Scholar. But after a fair comparison for the two methods, uh, you, you can, yes, so they were asking why filtering? So this is kind of announcement of the results, right? So the question was why filter? So in general, if you increase the number of features, that's points, it improves the results, right? For both of them, right? But if you increase the number of intermediate frames, it has minor impact. So what does it mean? That even if you add more things here in the middle, right? This is not really going to affect so much. So these intermediate poses are not helping so much. If you had more poses, more points, this helps. So imagine your detector instead of, I don't know, detecting hundreds, of key points very much, you detect more, and this is better. This comes at a price, right? But I think the important takeout is that having more poses is not really helping. And then the second very important result, after a fair comparison, again, they were not biased to one way or another, is that filtering, it's only superior if you have like very reduced um, computational budget, right? Because otherwise, this technique of, okay, so you take all, so here on filtering, remember, we are taking all poses before, right? And we are adding all this information. But it doesn't really affect so much, right? It doesn't affect so much. It's not really 
uh, helping you on getting more accuracy, right? So what is helping you on getting more accuracy is getting more features, right? So this is it. Um, and then if you filter compared with smoothing, um, it's still not superior, right? It's only when you have like very, very limited budget with very, very key, few key points. On that case, yes, maybe filtering is the way to go. But in all the other cases, separating things, doing tracking, and then doing this batch optimization or window batch of some small gives better results, right? So this, I think, was like a really interesting question to answer. And here there was no, no, um, uh, I mean, the results were very clear, right? It was not like, oh, you can use this in these cases and this in these cases, but it's not clear, right? So I think the answer was very clear. And guess what? So people are not filtering a lot, right, these days. Uh, most of the approaches are just taking batch methods because they have clear advantages. We have discussed them. But another argument in favor of this is, look, in the uh, vis um, visual slam, this has been tested. And, and it's only for very few. Uh, it's only for very few cases, right? Like, I don't know, you have a very small MCU, microcontroller or something. Maybe you cannot put a lot of calculations. Maybe you're just going to be doing key point filtering. That can be okay. I don't know. Very few points. But in all the other cases, even for standard, I think, you know, CPUs on not so powerful machines, like, I don't know, it's still better to do uh, a smoothing. Okay. So this is very important takeaway. You can take a look at the paper, but well, basically they try to provide like fairness, right? So it's not that they are biased into one way or another, but I think the community really needs this kind of papers, right? So not just, oh, I have the best method ever. So sometimes it's asking questions that are relevant, right? So um, maybe what is better to do and why it's not a good idea anymore to do filtering, which was really a good idea to do during the last, uh, I mean, before this, right? During the last uh, 50 years, it was best thing to do, right? No doubt, uh, but then later, batch methods, so maybe they have other advantages. Uh, this changes also because, you know, requirements change, other techniques change, so yeah. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, if you have any question, please ask on the chat. But now um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, Orb Slam. Maybe some of you have heard about it, right? But it's kind of the, best representation of all things that we have discussed, right? So uh, what these researchers were doing is they were compiling all work that they had done on their laboratory, um, other advances in other, um, you know, other papers, right? They were putting all together into a single um, implementation, right? So this is an open source implementation. Um, and this has become like a tool for the community for testing Visual Slam. Uh, it has some peculiarities, right? So it's basically a version of uh, parallel tracking with uh, improved, many improved uh, things, especially on relocalization, uh, loop closure and all this. So let me, let me just summarize them, right? So as I said, yes, this is keyframe based. Right, and, and the hard thing is putting all these things together. Right? So usually people just talk about one thing. I'm gonna talk about loop closure. And then they have their setting, their evaluation. And with this prototype, it's hard to integrate this in other modules, right? So we know what happens when you start putting a lot of code from many places, right? It's hard. So this effort I think was um, really, really a good advance for the community after this publication, there have been many papers using Orb Slam, maybe changing. Um, so they are using inside the Orb, uh, Orb key points, maybe using another kind of key points like lines or I don't know, Sift if you want, or your learn based uh, detector or descriptor, whatever you want, right? And and yes, with this, uh, I think yes, we will. We had access uh, for uh, well, this open source. Uh, tool. Uh, maybe some of you will be using this for the final project. Uh, we'll see, but um, wh what is the idea here? So 
they introduce the same kind of key point descriptors for all these tasks, right? So tracking, we know what tracking is, right? It's basically this localization of the camera while you are not getting uh, key points. Mapping, so this is a uh, batch optimization of all drill localization. So they can also allow you to get lost. I don't know if tracking, actually tracking <laughs> fails more than more often than what you think, especially with fast uh, rotations and you know this other kind of uh, problems. So um, monocular slam is not that robust, right? So that's why, uh, well, um, stereo can help here. So you have like some depth estimation. RTPD can also help. So this will be, this is also implemented by the way in open source. So this is the second version, or slam 2. And then, uh, I don't know, IMU, it's also like a good sensor that can add robustness, right? So different ways, it's not so easy to use. It requires a lot of, um, uh, well, let's say pre-processing and correct calibration, but it's an interesting sensor, complementary to uh, um, camera, right? And then the last task is loop closing. So this is the task that uh, some of you were asking here, right? So, okay, so you have a long map, large scale map, you go on the building, are you detecting loop closure? Yes, they are actively looking for loop closure, right? And they are just using the same key point descriptors. So imagine an image is just a set of key points, you compare with another set of key points and well, there's some techniques for doing that. Probably these days there's a little more advanced, but um, Yes, the problem is clear. So basically you want to know if you have visited this place before or not. Okay, and this is one of the uh, contributions, right? There's many, but they implement a survival of the fittest strategy for landmarks. So why is that? Because not all points are relevant. Maybe you don't want to keep all of them in your estimation, right? So they were deadly, um, deliberatively <laughs> removing some of them right after, I don't know, seeing that this point is not optimized, it's just observed once or twice, let's remove it because it's not helping in the overall, um, you know, map estimation or uh, slam estimation. And the second one is keyframes, right? So they allow this refinement over time. If you observe like a keyframe many times, maybe uh, you want to remove some of them, uh, maybe you want to change them slightly, there's a lot of things, right, that you could be doing and they do this as the problem increases. So these heuristics, I think are very effective, really, really effective. We've seen a change in, in what an implementation can do, right? So this question before and what PTAM is doing, uh, it was doing not the best thing, right? So they were just introducing keyframe and I think that was like a great contribution, but they were not solving the full problems. Sometimes you need other papers, other works, right? Just following up on this idea just to, you know, improve it, right? So this is how the community works sometimes. Okay, uh, yes, they allow a lot of um, configuration, like you can change parameters, you can change things. And yes, this of course is running on CPU. Uh, yesterday, for instance, we were discussing some techniques running on GPU and later, I think, yes, I'm gonna be describing some of them also running on GPU. But this one, if you have a strong CPU, it should work. Why is that? Um, well, we know that batch updates, what they need to solve is a large linear system, right? So this is uh, least square problems. What we need here is a good linear algebra library, right? So once you have this, it's uh, easy to solve. Um, I'm not sure if there's many good libraries out there for doing a uh, sparse Cholesky factorization. If there are, then GPU might be a very good idea. But so far, CPU gives like uh, a very good alternative, right? So that's the secret, right? So they are doing batch updates. They need CPU and then tracking, all these things. Okay, maybe they can be optimized on GPU. I'm not sure, but um, well, anyway this system just runs on CPU. So this is another great um, advantage, right? So it's very efficient. It's very well implemented as well. It's clear in C++, but uh, <laughs> well, I think 
Yes. Uh, well, you have the code there. So just go Google about this on their GitHub. Uh, they have like several follow-ups. Uh, there's also like, you know, some contributions of other community, improving a little, little mineral errors. But yes, I think the code is really uh, ready, at least as a tool for baseline comparison. Let's take a look at uh, what they do, right? Just, just very briefly. So uh, they get a frame here. Uh, they extract uh, features, right? In this case, or features. Map initialization, it's always a problem. So that's what, um, but let's not discuss about this today. If you want to just read on the paper. And then, uh, well, basically uh, they have all this process, right? For tracking. So the idea is, okay, you need to estimate where you are. You are not going to be adding these keyframes, but still you want to localize, right? And then there's going to be a module that is deciding if there's a new keyframe or not, right? So we are not really discussing here on this survival of the fittest that they are implementing. This happens later as you, uh, well, go on on the algorithm. But let's say that you decide that for whatever reasons, maybe, I don't know, number of key points is 70% of what you had before or some other heuristic like this. Uh, then you decide, look, this is a new keyframe. So if we have a keyframe, then we should be doing all these steps, right? So at the end, uh, what this thing is doing is just adding information and then you uh, basically solve the problem. There's also like this other uh, process running on, looking for loop closures, potential loop closures. On this, they do a lot of stuff. I'm not describing it, right? But uh, they are doing a lot of stuff just to um, add correct loop closure, right? So they do like several, uh, well, uh, let's say test, test or process, right? So uh, this is really principle. They explain it very well. And well, all this is running with the same key points. So if you want to take a look, this paper is also available on Canvas or on Google Scholar. But yes, it's, it's a very good um, reading. And now let's take a look at how this looks like, right? So here we'll have like camera poses, right? There's, uh, well, this graph of co-visibility graph, right? That they have like poses that, I mean, each of these poses corresponds to a keyframe, right? Uh, so some of them are connected, some of them are not connected. Here we see the same thing, right? It's always the same, okay, I'm gonna use straight. It's always the same principle. You take key points on the image, you might have them on the map, and then tracking is just, you know, uh, following this. Uh, how to create the full optimization? Well, you take all these images, you take all these points, and then you optimize both things. You optimize pose, and you optimize uh, 3D points with, um, well, with all these observations, right? Which are uh, pixel coordinates. At the end, uh, this is the same sequence, right? But just after moving a little. So what you see is this map is still sparse. We cannot really say anything about connectivity between points. This is just a bunch of points, all of them with their descriptor. I don't know, this thing, for instance, it's kind of a corner with, I don't know. Descriptor is basically a vector. Uh, you're encoding information there, right? But each of them is different. Uh, we have a lot of them. Right, so this is uh, really great that uh, uh, can run like on real time. So you can see like the effort doing this, we have visualization and well, it's basically taking all the good ideas from all around into one place. Okay, uh, let's do this. Let's do a little break, five minutes. And then I will continue explaining dense methods. If you also have other questions uh, from previous things that I have explained, please write them on the chat. And we, when we get back, I will try to answer them. Okay, so we'll be back in, yes, five minutes exactly from now.
All right, it's time to get back. Everyone is ready and refreshed for the last part. I was taking a look now at the participants. <laughs> so, yeah. I guess you are the brave students who endure all lectures. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, I'm gonna start. So on this new, on this new uh, paper that I would like to discuss, uh, things are gonna change slightly, right? And, and we'll see why. So now the uh, paper is called dense tracking and mapping, right? And what dense means. So this is one of the main difference uh, with respect to earlier, right? So before we were extracting features in the form of key points. So we see that all these environments had a lot of things on the background, like books, things on the wall and so on, right? Like a desktop. Right? So why is that? It's because it's easy to get key points from here, right? They are just salient things in your image and then, okay, you detect them and uh, the more you have, the better, right? So sometimes controlling the environment meant like going there, putting a lot of things on the wall or on the, a lot of useless things just to have uh, enough uh, texture, right? For your detector to, you know, give you a lot of points. If you have a white wall, then this is, this is really, really complicated. So what dense means here is that we are gonna be doing reconstruction for every pixel, right? So this is kind of a change, right? On, on what was our observation function. This is a little more involved because now the observation function, it's not just projecting a single point, but projecting all of them. And then, well, it slightly changed. So the objective is not uh, entirely the same, although some things remain the same. How to do this? What they do is they create a volumetric reconstruction. They have a grid. It's kind of special. It's not really squared. It's kind of prismatic, right? Because we know that images, uh, they are just rays that originate at the uh, origin of the sensor, right? And then they expand. So, um, but still the um, reconstruct, I mean, the 3D reconstruction is the grid. we'll see later. And then uh, for each keyframe, we have a lot, a lot of uh, values, right? A lot of vertices or values in this grid. So this is a little overkill maybe, but if we want to do dense reconstruction, this was the way to go, right? And then they are able to do camera motion estimation at frame rate. So this is tracking or localization if you want. And then, keeping the same scheme of keyframes, um, the optimization, the batch optimization, it's a little more involved, right? So here I'm not gonna be discussing on this, but uh, well, basically once you have all these 3D structures, optimizing with respect to your um, poses is, uh, well, you, you need to work on a little on, on the math of that. So if you're interested, you can take a look at the paper, but um, I'm just going to show like some examples of this, okay? There's also this very interesting um, paper. Some of the authors are the same of the uh, Y filter, right? So in this case, they were asking the question, right? What is better to do? Is it better to do just um, um, key point, I mean, sparse key point optimization, or is it better just to have like this dense estimation? And here the results were not so clear, right? I mean, probably yes, for some cases, it's better to use dense methods, but still uh, key points are there, right? So still it was, I think, an effort of comparing both. So there's like some insights, you can take a look at this. But uh, well, let's say that uh, it starts being a little more dependent on the case. Maybe a combination of both or something like that, right? Is the way to go, but uh, still this is work in progress and people are well, looking at this. So what is this 3D reconstruction or 3D volumetric representation of the keyframe, right? So what we have now is a image reference. This is the same as before, right? So this can be called our um, 
keyframe. And then what we have is we are trying to reconstruct this volumetric cost, right? So inside what is written is the, um, um, the photometric error inside of each of these cells. And this direction is just the inverse of depth, right? So at each of the cells, let's say that we are just measuring like what is this photometric uh, error that uh, we are storing, right? And this is our map now. Forget about sparse 3D points in the world, right? There's gonna be this volumetric structure. Uh, and then uh, when we do uh, this alignment, it's going to be a projection similar to what we did before. But now, uh, because it's dense, we are trying to match every pixel, right? So in this case, for instance, we are selecting this pixel. Okay, I'm gonna change the color. We are selecting this pixel. And if we just do this ray projection, we'll see that this pixel corresponds to all this row, right? And this is what we are uh, matching here. So some of them are gonna have like some results inside this volumetric cost. And we are just calculating this for each of these cells. If you change slightly the point of view and get to this other image, then the projection, um, I mean, of this new reference image, it should be this projection of the volumetric uh, representation should match whatever you are seeing, right? So the projection, it's a little more complicated. I'm not really going to explain more, but uh, the idea is for every pixel, we want to estimate like what is this error, right? And it's not now matching what is the distance between key points, but the photometric error, what it's doing is matching the full image against the other full image, right? So it's a little change in return. Uh, what you can get is results like this, right? So you have a sequence. It starts not very well aligned, not very well um, optimized, right? So you start with some depth here represented by these images. You see here like uh, intensity, it's kind of representing depth. And at the end, some structure just um, uh, emerges, right? So, well, this is the image with some key points. Uh, they also have a pattern. And well, basically, um, this was also very interesting that had a lot of follow ups, right? So the question is, why is dense better? So on some conditions might be better if you don't have a lot of texture, right? So you can still get like alignment information without having key points. And the overhead of this is a little more, right? So you need to calculate more things for sure. But still, what's another research line that um, well, some authors were taking? And yes, I think it opened this debate. There's still a lot of debate. What is better to do? Um, sparse key points. Some authors are convinced of that, or maybe dense, or maybe, I don't know, changing something else. Adding here, like deep learning is definitely one of the um, holy trials, right, right now. So how to include this properly, how to process features, what are they, right? So these are just common things that are being discussed now. Um, yes, if you want to take a look at some, some kind of thoughts on the current state of SLAM, there's also a paper, right, called Past, uh, Present and Future of SLAM in Canvas, if you want to take a look. It's kind of reviewing a lot of topics, different topics, giving like some thoughts of what is the next things to do. But um, let's say that the back end, what we have described here, like all these batch updates, um, looks good, looks robust, right? There's gonna be probably improvements over like generality. I mean, um, uh, guarantees on convergence, uniqueness, uh, detecting uh, divergence, all these things. But I think the general way of formulating, it's kind of very mature. And then all these things on processing features, this is still like a lot of, there's still a lot of things to do. Okay, let me now discuss on this other method, LSD SLAM. So what they were doing is semi-dense depth reconstruction. What is this? Instead of calculating for every pixel, they were just saying, look, that doesn't really make sense, right? Um, I mean, th th they were not the only authors talking about semi-dense reconstruction, but this is just a representative 
a paper. There's other papers that they were also doing semi-dense at that time. But the idea of semi-dense is um, you only calculate depth for those pixels that are significant, right? And significant might be that they have a height signal for whatever reason, right? You don't need to take the full picture, right? So maybe edges in your room or other salient points are interesting to take, right? Basically, uh, and more formally, it's non-zero gradient, right? So if you have white texture, it's gonna be very hard to get any information from there. You can, right? And that's what I was saying before that the optimization involved was like, I mean, was complicated. Uh, but this basically reduces the uh, requirements. You don't have to calculate so many points, uh, only those that have, you know, a strong signal. And why is that? Because then later you are gonna be reobserving them. Right, so on this paper, they were aiming at large scale maps. They were doing another uh, contribution that was, okay, one of the problems of monocular is um, observation of scale. Uh, you cannot really observe scale, right? All the see, all, all things you see are without scale. Or let's say that you have one ambiguity on how large things are. For instance, uh, this thing like here, is it this big? Or if I approach it here, it's, uh, 10 times bigger, right? So you cannot really do some big way just with an image. You need some reference. And this also creates drift over time, right? Like drift on scale. So with this, they were solving this problem uh, partially, right? And then, well, as always, they are just doing post graph optimization of all frames. Okay, um, so how it looks like? It's not really very new, right? So uh, the uh, some of the terms are very similar, like we do tracking. Yes, okay, uh, that's clear. Then what about keyframes? We do the same. The only thing that is gonna be changing now is that, for instance, you see here, this is the semi-dense. Um, wait, is this the semi-dense or this is the projected uh, reconstruction? Okay, I don't know. But uh, they are not taking all pixels, right, into account. Uh, and then uh, when they do the map optimization, what they are getting is, uh, uh, a similar, um, it's a similar approach of what we discussed before with Orbslam, with uh, PTAM and all this, right? But it's simply applied to a different kind of observations. Now, uh, semi-dense approaches, right? So let's say that, yes, there's tracking, there's this map estimation, right? Uh, we need to decide again, if we create a new keyframe or not. And for this, well, there's a lot of, uh, questions that maybe they're not so clear with the math, but uh, still you'd require this. And yeah, so this also was like a representative paper, I think on current trends. So it's basically making dense approaches a little more efficient with semi-dense and then all the other considerations. There's more follow-ups, but I'm not gonna go on there. And just um, to finish, let me add another kind of very important research line. This is, one paper, but there have been many others before. So I'm not citing or I'm not really discussing them. I want to discuss on OKBs like, um, well, technically the title is keyframe based visual inertial slam with nonlinear optimization because they were including a batch optimization. So we know what is the importance of this. While before all these other techniques, including IMU were some sort of filtering, right? Um, on some conditions, filtering, yes, can still be good, but we know some of their issues, especially um, if we want like solutions, if these solutions are a little far away from the optimum, right? If we do this several times, it has advantages with respect to filtering. And the idea, it's, it's very simple, right? So what we have is a window-based batch optimization. What it means, <clears throat> if you want, let's say that, yes, we have a factor graph of our trajectory full trajectory starting at some point, doesn't really matter. And we're including both things, right? We're including images here. In this case, it's just standard key point uh, based um, visual slam. And we are also adding IMU measurements, right? And you see here the, the, the difference, right? So here, uh, what we have is standard, these are poses, Landmarks, which are 3D points. This is just visual slam. If you want PTAM with more 
things on type of this, but they were proposing is a method for sensor fusion, right? In a tight optimization. That is when they were optimizing, they were optimizing for everything together, right? It's not that, okay, you take IMU, you take this observation, and then you do optimization of um, images. No, no, everything is happening simultaneously, right? So at the same time, they are um, estimating speed, uh, biases and, and poses, right? So the, all things are happening in the same optimization process. So this has advantages because if not, you need to reevaluate IMU measurements. And well, what I wanted to point out about this is that the optimization approach is a batch optimization, right? So imagine your factor graph. Now what we have is uh, measurements of IMUs here, okay? Uh, again, there's like uh, previous works on this. They were using filtering. Maybe others were using batch updates. This is just one representative, but it doesn't mean it's the only one. It doesn't mean they invented everything, right? So IMU and camera integration have been there for a long time. But why is this interesting, right? Why this sensor fusion is so interesting? It's because images, um, they provide some sensing modality and IMUs complement them very well, right? So you need to estimate them very well. So that's why here, all they are doing here on these nodes, <clears throat> these state variables are biases. So they estimate biases continuously, not at every uh, pose, but uh, let's say that because this is a uh, keyframe based uh, very often, right? Um, or let's say often enough. So you can imagine the importance of correct biases here on IMU. Without this, it doesn't work well. IMU diverges very, very fast if you don't have the correct. It also diverges very fast, especially if you don't have good uh, gravity observation. So that means that you need an accurate pose. So still, is this useful? The, question, the, the answer is yes, it's useful because you are more robust to changes in orientation. So your um, gyroscope gives you like very good orientation, right, over time. So on this, you are very robust. So getting lost, it's a little more complicated. It's still possible, of course. And then the other very interesting thing is that we were saying that uh, Visual Slam has this ambiguity on scale, right? You cannot say if something, if I'm like this size or I'm one kilometer or my head is one kilometer, right? Because this is just a projection problem. Um, but you can observe scale with accelerate, accelerometer, right? And it's a noisy sensor, but still the scale is revealed after some time. So maybe, I don't know, having depth is on like in stereo or RGBD is not the only way to go, but other complementary sensors here are um, IMU, IMU as well. We have one question, why yellow circles are not one to one connected to red? Well, but um, so the measurements here are not a single IMU measurement. So you can imagine this is a sequence of measurements, right? And, and maybe the starting point for one of them is the ending point of the other, right? So biases have some continuity and definitely speed here has some continuity. So um, it's a way of plotting them. But if you write the function, this transition function or observation function relating this, probably it's going to be involved like initial pose, final pose, uh, initial speed, final speed, initial bias. Maybe you don't need initial bias, but yes, you need here to estimate bias. So all of them are related. They came up with this scheme. But the important thing is not really this scheme, but the observation function that they use. Okay. Okay, so that, those were all the slides I have for today. This is again, just an introduction to Visual Slam. If you want to take a look again, go to the slides, maybe take a look at videos, maybe read some papers here that you were interested, maybe some papers signing these papers. But uh, with this, I think I'm just giving like a general picture of how things look like today. Uh, there's still a lot of follow-ups on this, right? So on visual inertia odometry, which is, or visual inertia navigation. There's a lot of uh, very interesting uh, contributions happening, a lot of methods. Uh, people are 
putting here a lot of uh, effort on doing research on this, on monocular slam as well. Um, all of them are better understood, I think, if you have like this idea of these initial seeds, right, on, on how the um, field has changed. Again, this is not a full review, um, this is not a survey, <laughs> but these are just representative techniques. So now, uh, if you want to go deeper into this topic, you will have more tools. Same as uh, with mapping, right? So with mapping, it's the same kind of issue. I was presenting uh, other techniques, and then you can follow up. Okay. Um, so classes are done just now. Now, good luck with final project. So I hope that uh, you will have one week and a half, right? Just to put things together from the proposal. There's some feedback, but again, we'll be happy to answer uh, your comments. Please not as last day, but keep working on this and be looking forward to hearing your presentations next Thursday, right? So remember you should be recording a video just to make things a little easier and yes I mean just try to enjoy the process of doing the final project all right thank you very much thank you bye